So yes, I'm coming from Kriya University, which is located in a place called Sri City, Andhra Pradesh. Now, I bet you haven't heard about Sri City, but not very far from Sri City is Sri Harikota. Now, that you all would have heard about. It's the ISRO, uh, the, uh, this is the Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sri Harikota, which is where ISRO uh, basically ro uh, launches its rockets from. And given our uh, location vis-a-vis -vis ISRO, you know, from our balconies and from the you know, rooftops in the buildings uh, on campus, we can actually see the rocket launches. And so it's become a part of something that uh, we do. I mean, we take visitors there if it coincides with rocket launches. Our students go there regularly. And as I said, you're drinking tea in your balcony and you can see, uh, see these things as well. And what, what is interesting to me about this, I mean, it's spectacular, like there's no, argument that rocket science, uh, launching rockets is something really quite amazing and spectacular. Like there's no argument about that, right? So sometimes when this happens, one of the things that also happens is that once the rocket has been launched, there's a contrail that's left behind in the blue skies. And what that is largely is the fuel uh, basically left behind to linger in the sky for a while. And you look at it, and I look at it from my office, and I'm like, you know, that's really evidence of the immense resources immense um, labor, both intellectual but also manual, and immense imagination and disciplines, various disciplines coming together to make this happen. In fact, this is considered so spectacular that typically to tell people that the task at hand is really not difficult and easy to do, what do we say usually? It's not rocket science, right? So rocket, it's in comparison to rocket science that things are seen as easy or difficult. And as I was one day sitting in my office, you know, meditating on a contrail, um, I was wondering, you know, is it really so that, uh, you know, what about the work in writing centers? Is it anything like rocket science? And you may say delusions of grandeur, but I figured that, um, there is a way in which it makes sense to put these two efforts next to each other, right? So you have Satish Dhawan Space Center, and now, congratulations all of you, you have the Bits Law Writing Center. <laughs> so Akhil, Satendra, Mokshada, all the students, uh, the others I met, um, uh, Lavina. Lavina and Eroika, I think, you know, this is, this is now, you know, something that you know, is worth it. It's worth it to the level as I think of that and you can believe me or disbelieve me, but really it is as worthy of that. Now, um, I want us to, uh, you know, think about this just a little bit. Why am I making such a big deal of it? Why do I think that this is as big a deal as launching a rocket? Um, and of course here you don't have the writing center per se with the entire building, but you know, if this works well, and, I, and if this works the way I'm imagining it will work, then don't be surprised if this building is known by the work that the writing center is doing. I completely expect that that will happen. But a little, stepping back just a little bit, why do I think that uh, the launch of this writing center um, is really very, very cool? Um, and that's because, you know, um, the history of writing centers in India is not very old. It's about a decade old, about the time that I also started working in this area. Though I have to admit that my first uh, writing center was a failed rocket launch. It didn't quite happen. Uh, but what I learned to do and the people that I met and the students that I taught and the teachers that I trained actually continued with me wherever I went right up to now at Korea University where two students who were MA students and tutors when I first met them and taught them, one of them is now a faculty member there, right? So in that sense it continued, but it didn't quite take off there. And that's usual, you know, the first dosa, the first pancake, the first rocket. But you learn, you learn from that experience and I 
I did. So 10 years, about in, in about 10 years now, there are a handful of writing centers, mostly in public universities, though not all of them. Uh, there are about 10 or 15 now, and there are two cooking, as I know. Uh, in the next six months, those should be launched as well. Um, so this is a relatively new thing, though by itself, writing pedagogy and writing centers are not new. They come to us, in, in it's very usual in American universities and colleges to have a writing program or a writing center, and their shapes are different. How they are taught, uh, how they are organized, maybe there are three, four models for it, but it's there. Uh, high school also students, you know, have courses in writing. Um, so there is a tradition there, and you know, uh, I had a chance to train with them in one of the biggest writing centers in the US as well. But in India, it being new, as I said, it's only 10 years old, the 10 or 11 years old, this whole history of setting this up. And so what has been there in its place? And that continues. Now all of you, the faculty members who studied in India will know that there's always a language cell, right? The assumption being that, oh, uh, students in India don't know English, and the whole problem is that they don't know English, and therefore, you know, what, how they are thinking in their own languages, what work they are capable of, always boils down to, you know, the correct article or the incorrect tense, right? And the fact that one has to think about all of this and it's not just a grammar issue is something that the language cell uh, pedagogy didn't often uh, think about. And also it was not their job. Their job was to work with um, English and quote unquote fix English, right? So you will know, notice that most colleges and universities, the old public universities that are around for you know, even 100 years, those will have provision of that. But clearly, it needed an upgrade. It needed, I mean, uh, it needed to be made into uh, something that's actually helping students write. Um, one needed to think about it a little bit differently. And so the writing centers are now working on a pedagogy which is uh, taking into account uh, you know, uh, uh, the differential language skills, but also setting up as its task what it is that students need uh, when they are given uh, college level essay assignments in their courses. So the faculty will know that uh, they teach and they say, okay, now write a 2,000 word essay, here's your reading list, or a 5,000 word essay depending on what the course is, or exams with long essay type questions. Uh, but, and quite often you will also hear that, oh, but why are the students not being able to write? Um, so then uh, the work very broadly that we thought of was, well, why don't we teach our students how to write these essays so that when they go to various courses, uh, they know what the basic elements are. And here I am talking about a kind of discipline agnostic uh, feature of the academic essay. So that's been what I've been working on and really figuring out how to make it accessible. I was so happy to hear both about the vision, but also what Ashish said, that this is not now a secret literary society that goes <laughs> underground, but really about making reading and writing accessible. We'll think about that a little bit more. But yes, so writing centers, the work of writing centers is something um, that I think is really the next level rocket launch that is happening in higher education as we speak. And I'm so glad there is another one for me to count and say, yes, now this year we are, we are ending this year with a total off, right? Um, so, so, okay, so it turns out that there are now a handful of writing centers. And I kind of broadly said that we want to make sure that students are able to uh, write in all their other courses. That's broadly what we want them to be able to do. But this really stood out to me. It's a quotation from um, Ashish, Dean Ashish Bharadwaj, uh, who uh, introduced the work of the writing center in these words. So I'll read that out. BWC. Uh, Bits Law School Writing Center, doesn't that sound good? <laughs> uh, is envisioned to provide robust writing support to law students and to create an atmosphere conducive to rich conversations and practices related to all forms of writing, legal, critical, and creative. Something that he repeated just now as he spoke. Now there is much to be unpacked in this one sentence. Yes. 
quick uh, comment. The, I think this, these words came from uh, the vision document. Vision document? Yeah, so between the vision document and all the discussions and conversations, I will say this is a very masterful sentence. Much to be unpacked in it, but I'm going to focus on two things, right? Um, one is this idea of writing support. And we really need to think about that. And as the writing center work begins, you will notice that that becomes the center of your concerns. How to provide writing support? What counts as writing support? You know, broadly, we can say, oh, there'll be tutors, there'll be courses, there'll be teachers, there'll be TRFs, we'll train them. But beyond, you know, underneath those broad ideas, what is it that you're working at? And what is that idea of support, right? Now, support might be, I'm really struggling with this answer in this class, can you please help me with it? And someone gives you enough support that they have pretty much written it for you. Would that be the support that you're looking for? Probably not. Students are nodding and saying yes. Um, I don't blame you. But so what is that support? I think that needs to be unpacked. And this other bit that I've highlighted here, that the, the forms of writing, legal, critical, and creative, right? It's fascinating. And I'll I'll say a little bit more about that. But these two things you will find, and my sense is the, the composition of this uh, institute so far, the composition of the law school and your teachers who I have met so far, tells me that between these two things, I think much of the onward journey of this writing center is going to be developed. And why do I think so? So let's start by thinking of writing support and you know, sticking with our imagery of rocket launches, do you see support anywhere here? The red thing, <laughs> right? So what kind of support does that red thing provide, do you think? Yeah? Say it loudly. To hold it, to hold it upright, to hold it till it's ready to be launched. And at the moment of launching, actually, there is no connection. All connection has been severed, right? So I call it bracing and letting go. So holding, you're absolutely right, holding, but then also being ready to let go at the point of something that's ready to then independently fly, right? So thinking about writing support, I thought that was a good metaphor and an analogy to keep building on. Um, but I thought we could also start by thinking about why is it that students need writing support? And it's not a facetious question, I hope, in the sense that it can be answered in a few different ways. For example, it could be answered by saying that, you know, usually most people, when they learn a language, and they start speaking, they don't need much help with it. Babies will learn to speak, but babies will rarely learn to write on their own. They don't pick it up from their environment. That this is a skill, a craft like any other that you have to spend time learning and perfecting and practicing. And so of course, therefore, people will need help. So there's that one kind of answer. Another kind of answer could be that, uh, you know, uh, schools have given up on teaching writing. Those of us that have either been in school or have taught students who have been in school recently find, and you know, very, very large school boards like CBSC, for example, from class 9 to class 12 is now focused on answering board exam questions in bullet point form, etc. They're not even writing sentences anymore. So, of course, they need support and help. But I think the really important reason why students need so writing support and the acknowledgement of that in the form of a writing center is something even bigger than all of this. It's acknowledging the fact that the composition of the students in our university and college classrooms have changed. We are now no longer addressing only students privileged by class, caste, and other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, um, inequities. <laughs> they are privileged by inequities. It's no longer that. You can no longer say that, oh, you can, and every time people do say it, I still hear it, is that, but what's there? Why do you want to have separate teaching for writing? I never learned that. We intuited, we read, and we learned. Right? The assumption behind that 
is that um, that they come from a certain context of privilege surrounded by books, going to libraries, going to the kind of very, very privileged schools, being from families where re reading and writing is a part of your natural context, uh, that uh, where you might even imbibe it from. But what about first generation learners? What about students from contexts that maybe there is, you know, there's, there's class privilege and wealth, but not a context of reading and writing. So that assumption, so what I feel uh, that having a writing center, by having a writing center, university acknowledges that not all students are coming from a place, a background, a context of having learned to read and write beyond the very functional reading and writing. There are most uh, common, most popular uh, boards, uh, school boards, um, they allow, they allow for that, right? So I think, and that is something that I think is very, very important, not just to acknowledge, but really embrace. And so this is why we are here. So we meet our students where they are. Right? Rather than, and this you may have heard, oh, but when I went to college, this was the curriculum, this is how we learned something. Thank you. This is how we learned something, and so our students should. When I was in college, it was done like this. Why aren't these people able to? You know, that attitude just doesn't work. And that giving up on that attitude it, and replacing it with meeting students where they are and teaching the students we have rather than the, than teaching an imaginary set of students who are not being able to, you know, read your readings or do your assignments or whatever else that is. So following from that, uh, when we say uh, writing support, then it automatically follows that then support is that of a safe, safe place to slow down, unlearn, relearn, and grow independent like that rocket. Um, and of course, I'll come to AI in a second. But really that, it's because by the time everybody reaches Bits Law uh, classrooms, the idea is they've finished 12 years of education. They know how to read and write. So in that context, to have a space where if you want to say, no, I don't know how to read this, and having a space where someone will go through that, uh, and that assumption that you should have already known this, why don't you know, is not judged, but you are actually able to work there. So if it means a line by line reading of a text, if it means going to the dictionary and looking up every third word, whatever it takes, that it is a place to do that. So students don't have to feel that I can't admit in class that I'm struggling with this, right? So it's a safe space that you can in fact, slow down. And sometimes the students will say, if I spend so much time on reading comprehension, I'll never be able to read all my, all the things that I'm, all the reading lists and the number of texts on it. And we tell them that do this. This is a place for you to slow down. And as you practice, you'll find that you're able to catch up with that as well. Right? So this is very important. The safety of students feeling that they're not knowing something is not a problem. Right? Um, and this growing independence. So then is the writing center that something that then you grow so dependent on that if they are not available, if the tutors are not available, you feel you can't function without them? No. So I know that you're all also doing trainings, the TRFs are being trained. Part of that training is really to help and support students in becoming independent. So instead of fixing everything, you say, okay, do you notice a pattern here? This is how we would fix this, keeping point X in mind, now are you able to do this on your own? So no, they will not rewrite your papers, they will not <laughs> fix your homework so that you've not done it and somebody else has, but that really teach you how to do this on your own, whether it's you know uh, rewriting sentences based on some principle, uh, whether it's working on the vocabulary, organizing your paragraph, whatever it is, right? So that always support with the idea of your how will you be able to do this on your own, and which is why. And I was in a podcast recording just a little while ago, and we talked about AI, etc. Of course, people have asked that. Uh, you know, what is the use of writing centers in the age of chat GPT? One of the earliest essays that came out was, is the college essay dead, <laughs> right? Because immediately all school, school and college students have turned to chat GPT to generate their essays. Um, and what I said in that podcast and what I'm saying now again is that there's a crucial, uh, first of all, it's not being able to do the level of work that won't get caught. So that's, a, but say it was really good and say you could use it to generate a really good A level, A grade paper. The point is, 
that then somebody else is doing it for you and you're not learning how to do it. You're not becoming in, an independent writer. So I'll just leave it at that if during the conversation more things come up about it, how I utilize ChatGPT to uh, help students see why it's not doing them any service. By letting them use it, I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, then support is learning in care and learning to care, right? And also, uh, I'll come to that point. Um, so I think when we think about support, thinking in terms of care, and in that I will choose to focus on the idea of carefulness, right? So teaching care means teaching carefulness, teaching carefully, but also teaching carefulness. And what do I mean by that? Care and attention to reading and writing. So when you are paying attention, you are actually showing care. When you are formatting the paper, when you are putting in page numbers next to your citation, when you are remembering to cite, uh, these are very small things and easily done. But what it does is that it shows that you, that you care about the paper that you are submitting. Typically, and these again, you know, remembering to put page numbers and formatting, etc., not very difficult to do. But if you submit papers without having done that, immediately the instructor who reads it will say, yeah, you had no time to put in your home, effort to put in your homework at all, right? So the immediate sense is that you don't care about the work that you're doing, right? And this is, as I said, a very simple example, easily fixed. But equally, the care with which you read, the attention. So when I say care, I mean attention. And so we are giving attention to text in how we read it and how we write it. And your writing teachers and your writing tutors will guide you and you know, uh, remind you that that's partly what is required. And then after that, uh, to think about the care, again, attention. And I mean it as attention to each other. Peers, right? So writing courses use a lot of peer review, for example. Learning to read and give feedback to uh, your colleagues in class. Uh, learning those things are as important for the feedback that you're getting as you are learning to um, uh, bring to your own work as well. And finally, support as care also from administrators for recognizing that teaching and supporting writing is an immensely laborious work, right? And the labor is of care. The care labor is immense. And this is, this is just to give you a heads up that right now you've started with a number of faculty, a few tutors, and of course these numbers will go up as uh, student numbers increase. But just wanted to say that you know, the, the emotional energy that goes into teaching writing, you know, easily sort of instructors get very, very burnt out very quickly. So when you make decisions about the size of the class, the number of courses a writing instructor teaches or a writing new tutor takes on, you know, you will work with what works in your um, institute, of course, but keeping in, keeping in mind, you know, the intensity of the care labor, uh, policies around hire and support and number of sections, number of people engaged to do this, you know, to keep this in mind is an important way in which writing centers are either made or unmade. And I have been through a situation of a made writing center, well, not formally, but, you know, really uh, the work happening, but then again, collapsing entirely, right? So it can happen. So just because something is run for four, four and a half, five years doesn't mean that it can't completely collapse uh, for the lack of administrative care, right? So just wanted to give a heads up and I'm looking straight at Ashish, of course. But um, so these are all, I mean, so there's all kinds of levels at which that care and support has to be extended, including at this level. So coming from there, you know, as I said, you know, how the shape of things are over the next four or five years and beyond that will depend, will really depend on how things work out here. But thinking about the shape of things is uh, ahead is I think a very good idea. And clearly given the vision statement and what Ashish had to say, and I'm sure what, uh, um, 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 Mokshada, that, sorry, that Mokshada will also elaborate on, uh, is about the bigger shape of things. And so there is the in institutional shape of things, but also the shape and form of things at, again, the level of text. So that was the second point from that vision statement, that, that this, what is all the support for? This support is for 
different forms of writing legal critical and creative right so when i say what is the shape of things you know what is is it important that the rocket is shaped quite like that for it to be launched you would probably say yes right the aerodynamic shape of the rocket is significant for it to actually uh, fly and complete the mission at, as it's supposed to so form structure shape these are very uh, important things and really it takes more than one and, and ashish already hinted at that that it takes more than one kind of reading and writing to produce even a very specialized professional right as as law students when you graduate from here it's very clear what you're supposed to do i mean you may choose to do other things but the point is that path is very clearly defined and that's what you've signed up for but this idea that you know there are these discipline adjacent things that you're going to do that that this university is now specializing is going to specialize and i can already see it happening in in being able to do that is a very very big deal right so then what does it take to launch a rocket or train a lawyer it takes a lot more than only classes in law right so the and here i talk about again the language of nourishment and grounding in reading and writing again the idea of meeting students where they are and this again from my experience of doing this on the ground i'm ground staff uh, to rocket launches turns out that the current students who are coming to our classrooms were in grade 8th or 9th when the covid lockdown happened very formative years for students to read and write that they went online and it's had an effect i see students being able to read something aloud but comprehending it is something that they struggle with so recognizing uh, really recognizing where it is and this is where the writing center is going to become really important that i cannot emphasize enough the importance of reading comprehension and all the faculty sitting here will agree right reading comprehension and if for example that's where the writing center steps in that's the right where the writing center also stepped in at kriya you know we change things around the minute we realize this and we reorganize tutoring support around reading comprehension etc when we realize this was happening so this goes back to the idea of really meeting the students need rather than uh, okay last year or year before last of course you have a, you have only one more year to look back but you know faculty will look back to have taught other other students in other place so that they got it why aren't they getting it so instead of that okay clearly they are struggling with this how can the writing center help in this occasion so really that conversation between what are we struggling with in our classrooms can we involve the writing center uh, to address exactly both for students and i don't know what the system of tutoring will be whatever it is it's something that both faculty and students can approach and why i'm saying this is that reading and writing is an overall thing um uh, you know really something that you can uh, draw energy from draw a sense of worth from and really enjoy i think that's really important certainly in a law school because mostly what i'm seeing is that there's a lot of reading attentive reading and a lot of writing as well there may be some courses maybe there's not as much writing but it's important to remember that for the training of lawyers there's no way around reading comprehension and uh, knowing how to use the support of the writing center for these would be something that the faculty will have to learn to articulate and the writing center will learn to either anticipate or respond to as as faculty um, uh, express it now learning of different genres of writing reading form and structure and learning precision in sentencing and i can't believe i get to say this here you know i've been using the pun about sentencing in all the sentence workshops and all i do and i said wait law school <laughs> precision in sentencing um uh, so anyway point being that again if we remember that the that central to this reading is uh, to this training is reading and writing then understanding genres so writing a judgment writing a petition writing a poem writing a story largely these are different in genres right there these are pieces of writing that if you understand the genre the form of then you you can write them right so there is a definite structural difference is a difference there's a definite difference in form between all of this and not that one is more creative and the other is less so i'm moving away from the distinction of creative and 
administrative, no, <laughs> creative and academic, uh, whatever. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that those differences, you know, you can't do more with and think about, but I'm saying that for a moment, if we suspend that, and we think about different kinds of writing in terms of genre, right? So if we think about that, different forms here, right? So critical, creative, in fact, I would even say that critical and creative have a lot of things going on that are overlapping there as well, right? So typically people want to see critical and creative as binaries. It's either critical or creative. Oh, I'm not a creative person. Oh, I'm so creative, I can't do academic. Those things exist, but I'm saying let's drop those for a moment. Then what we see is that for someone training in law, both these other genres of writing have a lot to teach you. Right? And thinking about form is something that creative writers and writers in creative uh, uh, and teachers in creative writing, they specialize in that. So if you really want to learn how form works, right, how a plot um, in, a, in a short story or a novel is moved along, how an argument in an academic essay is moved along, how a judgment in, a, in the writing of a judgment is moved along, the idea is that some of these things it's easier to teach with. For example, when I do narrative in an academic writing essay, right, academic essay, then it's easier to start with a story. That look, do you, do you catch the narrative here? And most people are able to catch the narrative in a story, right? And to then bring that into academic writing and academic essay uh, is something that becomes easier to do. So doing this because you know that this is crucial to how students read and write. Some people may respond to one thing better, other things, other students may respond to another thing better, but really giving that array of options where you may find your voice, where you may find your feet, right? So therefore, the form, and you know, when I look at this, I'm like, okay, can you think of the kind of courses that are possible, right? Uh, can you, and I'm thinking also the kind of, you know, cross-pollination of ideas in terms of how to make reading and writing central to what is traditionally taught as only a course in law, right? C can that be galvanized? And I think there are lots of ideas here. And yes, I would say that that's possible to galvanize. And what I'm most excited by is this, right? Really thinking about the legal as made up of the critical and the creative. And, and, and I love that sentence so much and I love the sentiment even more is because precisely it is this, that you know, it, it makes you think about learning and teaching law in a different way, that this can really affect the pedagogy of law. If you think about teaching law as made up of critical thinking and creative writing as well, Right? And so what I am really looking forward to is exactly this, right? That there will be uh, a new pedagogy of law, that the new pedagogy of writing pedagogy that we will, that will emerge from this center precisely because of the kind of people who are employed here. Like this is not easily possible elsewhere, right? For the people who are here, that they, what, what will writing pedagogy look like? I don't know that yet, but I know that something new hides here. And that is my wish for you all. That is my hope for you all. That this is, and, and nothing short of this will do. And why this is rocket launch, now you can see that this is not going to be easy to do, but it's actually possible to do this. I can see this from having looked at your curriculum and from the people who are sitting here and their interest in both uh, teaching, reading and writing and learning reading and writing. So with that, I'm going to leave you with a boat. How did a boat come here? And the, <laughs> and the story is that I have given you all the rocket, but when I started, it was a boat. And we used to joke and say, you know, we are building the boat and sailing it at the same time. Um, and that was the dominant imagery I remember we would uh, use for the work that we were doing, that there was no time to really finish a boat and sail it. We were doing it together. And this remains close to me. This is from a Ghat in uh, Vara, a boat yard in, uh, where they were building uh, in Varanasi where I spent an afternoon. And I want to leave you, leave you with this poem by <coughs> uh, Lucille Clifton, one of my favorite African-American poets. Um, and this is me blessing your rocket and blessing uh, the boat that has led to the launch pad from where you are, are launching your rocket. So blessing the boat, Lucille Clifton. 
May the tide that is entering even now the lip of our understanding carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind then turn from it, certain that it will love you back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever, and may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. Okay.